Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 13, um, verses 44 to 46, page 819. Let me read it to us. It says, the, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So it's a very famous story, this one. I, I don't know if you had this growing up. I, I had this, um, this children's stories book when I was growing up. Lily and John have this, our, our children, as Todd has mentioned. I think it retells this story so well that I am basically going to show you one of its pictures and tell you a summary of what it says. Um, it, it, the, the story goes, they, it's sort of hammed up a bit, if you know what I mean. They, um, it begins by saying there's a, a merchant, he's a, he owns a mansion, it has five floors filled with fine furniture. He, I re particularly remember this one as a boy. He has three fridges full of fizzy drinks and four freezers full of fast food. And uh, that was, uh, there's a great picture of that one. He, um, he has, a, he has a, a fine fur coat. He has a favorite fez with a feather. And um, anyway, he has basically, and he's got more money under his mattress than you could ever imagine. Much more, yes. He has everything he wants. So it's really, it's really well told. It's fantastic. Anyway, he, as, as you can imagine, there he is. He's going out. He, um, he, he sees a shop, and in the shop window is a, is a pearl. And he thinks to himself, I must have that pearl. And so he goes home. He sells everything, absolutely everything that he has, except for his fez with the feather because it's his favorite. He piles up all the money. He takes it to the shop. He tries to buy the pearl, but it turns out he's short of five pounds. So he sells his fez for a fiver and he buys the pearl. And what I particularly like is this last page. I don't know if you can see, there's a, there's a picture of him here. If your, your eyesight might need to be better than mine, but he's, he's there in his nighty and boxes with nothing but a pearl, and, and the caption says, says, his, says this, Jesus says, God is like the merchant's pearl. It costs everything to know him, but he is worth more than anything in the world. I, I remember one time, sorry, Richard, do you mind if I plonk that next to you? Um, I remember one time I was reading it to Lily. Lily was about a year and a half. That day I'd had a, a conversation with a, with a couple who were, who were walking away from Jesus. They were pursuing a relationship that Jesus says is wrong. They didn't think they were walking away from him, but they were. And uh, I was, Lydia asked me to read it to her, so I did. And, and, and I was in tears by the end. And, I, and I said, we got to that last page and I said, Lily, it's true. It's true. Lily, don't give up Jesus for anything. Give up everything for him. And Lily, you know, poor Lily being a year and a half, is probably thinking, what is wrong with Daddy? <laughs> We've read this story before. But it is true. Sometimes when we make costly decisions, we can wonder, was that worth it? Nowhere is that more true than in the Christian life. Whether we are considering becoming Christians or whether we have been Christians for many years, whether we are sacrificing something for the thousandth time, or whether we're asking ourselves whether we should sacrifice it for the first time. The world says it's a nonsense to follow Jesus. The devil says we're stupid, and our flesh quite agrees. But Jesus tells us this parable to remind us of that wonderful truth that knowing Jesus will cost you everything, but he is worth everything in the world. So that's our two points for this morning. Knowing Jesus will cost you every, everything, but he is worth more than anything in the world. So one of the most obvious common features of this parable is that both men sell all that they have. So verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has. Similarly in verse 46, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. And the point is, as we said, if you want to know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, who is the pearl, you must in some sense sell all that you have as well. Now, if we were living in North Korea or in much of the Muslim world, that would be obvious to us. It would be apparent immediately that to follow Jesus Christ would cost us everything. 
It's a stark choice for many people, Jesus or the possibility of a job, Jesus or freedom, Jesus or simply staying alive, Jesus or your family. But here, in this country, sometimes it might not be so obvious. After all, many people call themselves Christians, and it costs them very little indeed. Many people will say to Jesus, you can have my Sunday morning, and perhaps a, a Tuesday or Wednesday evening or wherever it is, and you know what, I'll even try and be a nice person. But what I do with my money, how I use my time, who I date or how I raise my children, that is for me to decide. Many people in this country take the name of Christian and effectively treat Jesus like a good mate whose advice they can take or leave, or like a genie in the sky to grant their wishes and forgive their sin. But Jesus is not a good mate. He is not a genie in the sky. He is the king of heaven. These parables begin, verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure. Verse 45, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of pearls. How do you, how do you enter the kingdom of heaven? It's not so much about going to a place, but submitting your life to the king of heaven, as we've been hearing about this morning. And to do that costs you, you everything. This is, this is a very simple and obvious illustration, but there are some people in life whom to know it costs. So if you're an employee, if you have a boss, it will cost you to know your boss. When you enter the employer-employee relationship, you have to agree to do a certain number of hours a week, to do certain duties, maybe even be a certain sort of person. Another example would be your spouse. I suppose it's an obvious one as well. But when you get married, what, if, particularly if you get married in the Church of England, what do you promise one another? You say, I promise I will honor you, love you, and protect you, and forsaking all others, be faithful to you until death do us part. You promise that no matter what happens, no matter how badly things go, all that I am I give to you, and all that I have I share with you within the love of God. Now, you might have been thinking, well, in your case, Ed, that wasn't very much. And you would be right. It wasn't very much at all. But you get the point. It costs to know your boss. It costs to be married to your spouse. And it costs to know Jesus. And it costs everything because the relationship we have with him is not that of a boss. It is that of a bridegroom, but it's also more than that. It's that of a subject to the king of heaven. Sorry, let me try and get some. Everything we have, everything we do, Everything we love, he demands rule over. He demands to rule over your work, your investment, your time, your money, your friends, your relationships to your friends, your spouse, your children, your parents, every single one. He says, whoever would be my disciple must deny themselves and follow, take up their cross and follow me. And he told these sorts of parables to teach us that we must surrender all to him. He even demands of us whatever our equivalent is, of the favorite fez with a feather. I remember um, when I started to realize that Jesus needed to be my king, I just, started uni I just started the university for the first time. It's the strange thing about doing theological training. I had two great loves in life. I, uh, I, loved, I had a girlfriend who was not a Christian, and I loved badminton. The Lord very kindly sorted out my badminton for me. I turned up to tryouts, I beat everyone I played, and they didn't want me. It's one of the best things that ever happened to me. I was really glad that happened in retrospect, not at the time. I was a bit miffed. But my girlfriend, that was more difficult. And basically what I wanted to do is, as I heard Jesus had to be my king, I wanted to say to Jesus, look, you can have, you can have everything else, Jesus, but you can't have her. I wanted to ring fence her from the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can have these parts of my life, but not this. And that's very easy to do, isn't it? Maybe that's some of us here right now. You know there's an area of your life that you are trying to ring fence from the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can have these things, Jesus, but you can't have this. It might be a, it might be a relationship. It might be, it might be a collection of, of cash. It would be a common one. It might be an ambition. It might be a career. It might be a grudge. 
But we can only know Jesus on his terms. And his terms are that he must be our king as the sovereign Lord of everything. He demands everything. Knowing Jesus costs everything. And when you give him everything, it looks nuts, mad, insane. It's, why, it's partly why I love that story, that, that picture at the end. You know, here's this guy. I remember it very vividly from when I was a boy because I was thinking, you know, he had sausages and chips. At least he could eat those. He can't eat a pearl. What is he doing? He's there in his nightie in boxes with a pearl. And he's happy. It looks mad. You can imagine, imagine it in real life. Imagine it actually happened. Imagine he comes home from having found that pearl. He hasn't yet sold everything. Imagine he's married with his kids. Dear, why are you selling the settee? Well, I, I want to buy this pearl. What, what are we going to do with, with watching the TV? Well, I, I'm actually selling that too. Like what? In fact, I'm going to sell the house. You're going to sell that what now? Where are we going to live? We're we're not, dear. We're we're going to have nothing. But I will have this pearl. And she's off. I probably don't need to tell many of you this, really. You probably already know it. Maybe, Maybe you come here each week. You read your Bible and you pray every day. And your, your family wonder whether you've been brainwashed by a cult. Maybe your colleagues think you are daft for living the lifestyle you do, which is half as nice as theirs, because you're giving so much away. Maybe you're at school. I, I, was, I was listening to a story of a friend, and they were saying they had a, a daughter. Their teacher asked, OK, which, which of you in the class are pro-choice? Everyone put their hand up. Which of you are pro-life? She alone, her daughter, put her hand up. Maybe that's you at school. You're the only one who believes what you believe. And your friends think you're, well, worse than crazy, really, for thinking that. Maybe, maybe you gave up a promising career to be at home with the children. And you submit to your husband and your friends look at you and think, what? You submit to your husband? And they look at you and you think, this is, they think you're mad, absolutely nuts. They don't get it. Jesus isn't that precious. And sometimes that can get to us. Sometimes the pain of the sacrifice can make us ask, am I mad? Maybe you ask yourself that this, this morning, trying to get the kids here, bundling them in the car. Why am I doing this every week? Why are we battling this? Maybe you're asking this, giving your money to the point that you can't repair that problem at home like you'd like to. Maybe, maybe you've, by not being willing to marry a non-Christian, you're starting to think, maybe I'm never going to be married at all. And who knows, maybe this will be the year where doctors and teachers and employees will start to lose their jobs for not supporting LGBT rights. Maybe this will be the year where Stuart Cashman gets better, as we've all been praying for, and then conversion therapy laws come in and he gets shipped up to prison. And we will ask ourselves, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the right thing, giving all for the Lord Jesus Christ? And the whole point of the story is, in the end, if all your family called you mad, all your friends left you, and you lost all your wealth, your career, your home, and ended up persecuted and beaten and imprisoned, and so all you had left in the world was the Lord Jesus Christ and your boxes, And then even if you lost your boxes and your life, you would still have everything that is worth having. At the end of the story, both men have nothing but a field and a pearl that cost them everything. And they are rejoicing. They're over the moon. Because though knowing Jesus will cost you everything, he is worth more than anything in the world. And that's the second thing, the, the main thing, really. Verse 44 again, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure. And then verse 45 again, The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. It's a, a funny thing, you know, joking about how having a spouse will cost you. It does cost you. And the weddings, weddings cost a lot of money as well, an awful lot of money. And uh, 
marriage is regularly hard, but it's a strange thing. I don't know if you've noticed this at weddings. You can go to weddings and you think, man, how much does this must have cost them? It's like so expensive. And then they're making these really, you know, difficult promises. And yet, do you know what people are doing? Are they, they're smiling. Have you noticed this at weddings? People are very happy. It's a very strange thing. Don't you they know how costly it is? It's going to be very difficult for them. Yeah, of course they're happy. They're happy. I'm, I'm being silly, of course. Everyone is happy because at a wedding we celebrate something that's so good that it's worth all the costs that are made. And sometimes the costs aren't really bad for us either. What exactly does it cost you to know Jesus? Well, let me tell you one thing it costs you. It costs you your sin. Your sin that was ruining your life. We can think obedience to Jesus is going to weigh us down, make life really hard until we start to obey. And what we find is a bit more like what it must be for a whale who's been floundering on the beach to finally make their way back to the ocean. It'll cost you your sin. It'll cost you your ease. But we were not made to live easy lives in this world. And yes, often it will cost you good things. Good things. But the reality is that these things can never satisfy us. And these things we will lose anyway. It's one of the great ironies that the very things that we can try and ring fence from the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ are the very things that we will, all, will definitely lose one day. I remember another conversation I had uh, with a really good friend. He, um, he left the Lord Jesus Christ to, to pursue a another relationship that was wrong he 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 went after another guy he left jesus for him that he was a bloke as well and within one month they'd broken up and i was so gutted for him but in the end all of us we must leave all of it behind the family the career the money whatever it is a reputation will fade along with our bodies but he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And you will never lose Jesus. I don't, I don't know you guys. I'm, I'm here as a visiting preacher. You don't know me. I, I don't know how much you've had to give up for Jesus. This is a church plan. I imagine there will have been quite a lot of sacrifice to get this set up. You, maybe you think there's not very much, but maybe there's big things. I want you to think for a moment, what has it cost you most? What does it cost you most to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? It's maybe a reputation, maybe a career, maybe a country. People are the most precious things, right? Let's say it's a person. Let's say it's a family member who, who doesn't speak to you anymore because of your faith in Jesus Christ or, or a friend who wants nothing more to do with you. And you think that they are they're lovely, they're funny, they're, they're capable, you have, you have good memories together. You brought each other joy and you thought life would not be life without them. If you have the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the one who painted their beauty, who imagined their humor, who gave them their personality. He is the life of their life. From where? Does their goodness, loveliness, their truth come from, if not him, who is eternal and infinite love, truth, and goodness? Whatever we have lost for Jesus, it is a creature. And all creatures reflect, to some extent, the glories of God, some of his perfections. And that's why we love them. And that's why they're good. But if you have Jesus, you have the image of the Father, the one in whom all God's fullness dwells. How lovely must he be who is the source of all goodness, truth, and beauty. You have the creator. You have God in Jesus Christ, who now mediates his goodness to us in a million creaturely rays, the glory of God is on display in this room in 10,000 ways. If only we had eyes to see him, but we will see him one day with unveiled faces and in his face, the, the glory of God. And that one look will make up 
for all that we have suffered in this life. One day of that paradise will be beyond comparison of all the sorrow of this life, no matter how great, how many, or how severe. And then it will last forever. My friends, if we had our heads screwed on, we wouldn't ask ourselves, is following Jesus worth it? Of course it's worth it. Of course he's worth it. If we had a head screwed on, what we'd ask is, why would he want anything to do with me? A sinner who's done wretched things, who so regularly undervalues how precious he is. But there is a, another way in reading, of reading this parable. The obvious sense, the one we naturally read it, is that we sell all for Christ to take him who is the pearl of great price. But there is, of course, another little picture in here. I imagine you've already spotted it. Another is that Christ sold all for us to make us his treasure. And so not ceasing to be what he was, he became what he was not. The eternal was made in time. The infinite became finite. God became man, not ceasing to be what he was. And his family, they did call him mad. And his friends did leave him. And he had no wealth and no place to lay his head. He was mocked and slandered. His clothes were stripped from him. His career led him to a cross. But there he died for the sins of his people. To make them his treasure and to bring them to his father and save them forevermore. He died so that all who believe shall be his and he shall be ours. And so, my friends, there is no greater treasure than the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us this morning and every day of our lives put our trust in him. No matter who we are, no matter what we have done, no matter how far we feel for him, let us come to him as our Lord and our Savior and our God. And let us follow him, submit our lives to him, no matter what, because he is worth it. So, so worth it. Knowing Jesus will cost you everything, but he is worth more than anything in the world. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we, we thank you so much for what you have done for us. That you came from heaven to earth to suffer and to die. To make us your treasure for the joy that was set before you endured the cross, scorning its shame. And Father, please would you help us now to do the same. Please help us to endure whatever it costs us to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever this year may bring, please, Father, would you help us to cling on to him, to value him more than anything in the world. And we ask it in his precious name. Amen.